We're about to hear um, about the story of these new kangaroo paw from Nicky Grounds, who's been involved in, um, in their breeding. Uh, he said he's been working on these since 2007. He's a senior plant breeder at Kings Park. Uh, and he's going to take us through a little bit of background on, on Anagazanthus and then about the selection process and also what the future is for these amazing new kangaroo paws. So Digby, please, thank you very much for putting some time aside for us, which, you know, being in WA, it's much earlier for you than it is for us here um, on the East Coast. And we're really looking forward to seeing and hearing more. Yeah, look, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, to have a chat about it uh, and you know I'm two coffees in so hopefully I'll make uh, some sense to you all. Um, so yeah I manage the plant development and breeding programs here at Kings Park and one of the um, iconic genera that we work on is uh, Anagazanthus and uh, I actually note uh, Angus is uh, uh, here with us so I'd just like to acknowledge Angus and uh, his fantastic knowledge sharing that he's, uh, that he's done with Kins Park. Uh, we both work with Rand Botanic Books and it's been a, a fantastic partnership. So thanks, Angus. I just expect that uh, back from you sometime, by the way. <laughs> um, so Angus Panthus, I just walk through, hopefully my, try to get my screen to do it. Um, so the distribution of Anagazanthus uh, is the southwest uh, of Western Australia. So it's an endemic species, a genera, sorry, of about 11 uh, species and uh, occurs from just south of Shark Bay uh, through uh, just east of Esperance uh, in that uh, western, southwestern corner. Anagazanthus are generally what we call fire ephemeral. So they come up. Uh, after a burn, and this uh, slide shows uh, Anagazanthus anisus uh, just emerging after a fire. Uh, and this was uh, the cat's paw Anagazanthus humulus taken near Regan's Ford uh, this year. And generally, what happens um, um, after a fire is that they, they come up en masse. Uh, and hang around in the landscape for a year or two, and then they uh, really disappear from that landscape and you'll get occasional ones occurring from time to time. Uh, that photo's Anagazanthus pulcherimus uh, there, which is one of the parents of uh, the hybrid yellow gem, if anyone knows that. Uh, so with this, um, I guess, ephemeral lifestyle in cultivation, uh, Anagazanthus get uh, two types of disease uh, most significantly and one is uh, the disease called ink spot which is that black spotting on that leaf that you can see and they also get uh, a rust fungus which is um, it, that central leaf there just above the black spotting you can see that brown pustules there and both of those diseases either together or by themselves uh, will kill uh, susceptible plants uh, certainly make them unsightly uh, during that process. So this here is a a, a really lovely um, lime green and orange coloured hybrid I developed early in the in the uh, program. But and as you can see, it's absolutely been hammered by rust, and that plant eventually went on to die uh, because at that level. Uh, of infection, the plants can't survive. <clears throat> and this is the, uh, the type of effect that you get uh, right at the end, which is uh, disappointing and not really what you want for a commercial plant. So in the early days, um, the breeding program uh, targeted disease tolerance, particularly in those smaller uh, growing Anagazanthus species the cat's paws and, and plants as big as say the red and green and, and, uh, and Exanthus manglesii. And you can see from this slide here, these are all siblings about the varying disease tolerance that you can get at the same stage of growth. And so a plant like the one on the left of screen, which is really healthy, 
um, is the one that we would target for further breeding. And so we used a process called recurrent selection. And that base, it's a, it's a process they use to increase yield in uh, crop plants, for instance. Um, and where there's multi-gene uh, control over attributes, it's a good way of, of doing that. Um, so recurrent selection is really taking the top two or three um, performing plants out of, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 uh, seedlings that you grow. And it could be for any attribute. Um, but in this case, we did it for disease tolerance. And then you... Um, cross those again with others that are similar in tolerance or self them. And then you work through the various generations. Uh, and I think we're about uh, four to five uh, generations in and we've managed for most of our newly emerging hybrids to have quite a lot of tolerance to disease. Just on uh, how it actually works. So this uh, photo uh, shows an example, uh, see the bicolor or Gabriele. Um, and the pollen is presented, uh, an example, so generally bird pollinated. So the pollen's presented at the top of the flower and you can see it on the anthers there. And then the uh, stigma, which is just a, a little harder to see, is either a little further out from the flower or around where those anthers are. And then we just take the pollen from one flower, I just scrape it off with a, a little pocket knife. And then we transfer it to the stigma of a, another parent that we think has good attributes uh, for producing hybrids. Uh, these then are uh, grown on in the glass house uh, while, they, um, while they're fertilized and then uh, set fruit. And so each of these tags records the crossing event and the, and the date they were crossed. And we use a database to record the parents of each cross, uh, which is critical if you're trying to track uh, breeding over a number of generations. So uh, this is the flower after it's been pollinated and aged. And you can see where those tags are. The ovary of the flower has uh, swelled. And inside that, there are um, anywhere between one and, and 60 seed. Um, and so about four months after pollination, we start harvesting. Uh, and then we'll store that seed for up to 12 months sometimes. And depending on um, how much seed we got and what the cross is, we'll then um, give it a heat shock of just below 100 degrees Celsius and then soak those seed in smoke water for 24 hours. And then they get sown in punnets um, and given about two weeks at 15 degrees Celsius. And then we'll get germination. And you can see here um, some plants uh, from 2019 uh, germinating in those punnets. Uh, once they get to about the size that you see on screen there, we'll pot them up into uh, the pots that you see at the back. And then they're subsequently grown on uh, <clears throat> through flowering. They're taken outside uh, and just left to flower. Anagazanthus are unusual, particularly the smaller flowering runs in that they'll flower for the first time in response to plant size. And so we uh, can have anagazanthus flowering all year here at Kings Park, uh, which helps the breeding program because we can cross all year. And then the following year, um, they'll revert to seasonal flowering. So this slide shows a couple of the newer hybrids. Um, these are siblings, these two hybrids, and you can see uh, they're quite different colored, similar sort of growth habit and leaf, um, but different colors. And that's due to the complex uh, a parental background uh, of these hybrids. And you can see also that they're very clean uh, compared to the earlier slides I show you where they were um, fairly rust and, and ink spot affected. <clears throat> so once that happens, we evaluate them. Um, we, we either kill or uh, throw out 
probably 99.9% .9 of the hybrids that we produce. Uh, we treat them uh, fairly toughly. We don't treat them for disease. Um, we just give them water and they grow outside. Uh, and those that come through are uh, generally pretty tough and disease tolerant. And then um, with Rain Botanicals, who are our commercial partner, um, we have a dialogue with them and then we send them plants uh, in tissue culture. We initiate them into culture and then send them to RAMS uh, for further evaluation. And then if they get through that system, um, they'll get commercially released. So our first um, release out of the, this particular program um, is Kings Park Royale, and that was released in 2018-19. We'd previously released uh, Kings Park Federation Flame um, but that was uh, not actually a controlled hybrid. It, it was a mutation that came up in a seed lot of Anagazanthus rufus. And um, we eventually released that commercially uh, through Ram Botanicals. That's just come out of its um, plant breeders rights protection. Um, so it's now available for anyone to grow. In uh, 2021-22, which is now, we, through RAMS, released five new uh, hybrids under a celebrations theme. Um, so the first one is Aussie Spirit, and uh, uh, that's green gold. Um, it's quite a, uh, a compact, free flowering plant. Most of these uh, hybrids that you'll see have got quite a lot of the Anagazanthus viridis, which is the green kangaroo call in them. Or, um, the, uh, a commercial, there was a commercial one um, of viridis available for some time called Green Dragon, uh, which is uh, some of you will know. Um, the next one is called Cocktail. And uh, as you can see, it's got a, a greeny blue upper part of the flower and a pinkish purple tinge. Um, again, uh, in a pot, it's very free flowering. Fireworks is the next one. Uh, it's a little darker in shade than the previous one I showed you with a, a, a much darker ovary. And it's uh, a bit more taller growing than cocktail. Carnival is the next, and I, I've spelt that wrong, so it's actually Carnival with an E. Um, and this one's a, a really beautiful um, pinkish mauve colour, quite unusual for Anagazanthus. And then the, uh, the final one is, is the blue. Uh, kangaroo paw masquerade uh, and this one's got quite a bit of attention uh, so uh, it's gone a bit crazy on social media uh, it's the first uh, blue kangaroo paw that's been commercially available we first came up with a blue in 2012 uh, but the disease tolerance wasn't there and so it's only now that we've managed to get both the color and the disease tolerance uh, into uh, a blue flower plant. Uh, and that's it sort of growing with lots of flowers on and uh, Friends of Kings Park um, growing area. So these uh, five varieties are, are being released globally. So they're, um, they're <clears throat> I understand they're already available in the Eastern States at, in small numbers. They're going to be released here in Western Australia uh, next month. Uh, and they're also, this uh, particular photo is of uh, the plugs uh, growing in uh, Southern California in the USA. And so they're about to be released there. They'll be um, put into Europe, China, Japan, and South America, I believe, in, in the next couple of years as well. <clears throat> so aside from those, uh, the five and um, Royale, we've got a number of lines uh, that are currently being trialled. And uh, this slide is a uh, photo taken at, at Ram Botanicals of a whole range of 
the varieties they have, not just Kings Park ones, but a lot of Kings Park varieties. And one of the things that we're seeking to do, one of the attributes we're hoping to bring through in Anagazanthus is the branched flowering. And you can see some of those there have quite branch flowering. And what branch flowering does is allow um, the colour impact of the pot uh, to be more predominant with just one or two stems rather than needing um, you know, multiple stems on the plant. Uh, this attribute comes also from uh, Anagazanthus flavidus, which is um, one of the tougher uh, kangaroo paws. And so we're trying to breed um, Anagazanthus flavidus into our novel colours. So the flavidus, and we don't quite know what it is yet, it has, seems to have a different colour pathway uh, to any other Anagazanthus. Uh, we've just <clears throat> been successful in, in partnering with Edith Cowan University. Um, uh, with, we obtained a, a half a million dollar grant from Australian Research Council to actually research colour in kangaroo paws, trying to find out what the blue is, because we don't know, and what the pathway is that produces it, as well as um, mapping the genome of Anagazanthus um, anglesii for the first time. And that'll be a huge help in, uh, in breeding in the future. So that's one uh, attribute that we're looking at, but we're also looking to bring in some of these, uh, what we call mini uh, kangaroo paws. So these would be suitable for um, little border plantings or even florist lines, uh, that type of thing. So as you can see there, we've got a range of different colours in the, these minis, uh, the blues and the purple, greens, uh, orange and purple. So we've got a number of colour forms of these now that are part of the trialling. And uh, depending on how they go and the feedback we get, hopefully we'll see some of these in the market in the not too distant future. In terms of other colours that we have coming through, this slide sort of shows both some of the, the novel colours and the colour combinations. Um, and it's just a selection of, of nine um, different hybrids that we have. Some of them um, aren't tolerant of disease enough to come through the system, but you can see uh, how widely variable the colours we have with from you know the one on the on the left with the black and the red uh, through to the white on the right the blues um, plants with flowers that change color as they age um, and then various combinations as well so the future um, for anaxanthus is is um, quite bright there's lots of variation that we've achieved already um, we'll have in the future a range of uh, highly disease tolerant, tough garden and flowering pot hybrids uh, coming out um, for, for years to come. So I'd just like to thank my team, um, Max Crowhurst, Tony Scalzo, Prafel, Yamaratia, Shannon Murphy, and in particular, our volunteer master gardeners who uh, great assistance to us here at Kings Park and uh, none of this would have been possible without their help so always like to thank them uh, and so that's it so I'll end it there and happy to take questions comments uh, etc Thank you. That was really fantastic. I, there were lots of <laughs> comments going up about sensational and wow and all that kind of stuff. And it, it really is quite eye popping. I, I first saw them. Angus had some pots at a um, plant festival down in Hobart and uh, it, they knocked my socks off there. So I'm really pleased that we're, we're seeing them here and that they're going to be able to be bought and put into gardens. So um, yeah, questions. Who's got, um, unmute yourself, you know, when you want to ask a question, but um, we've got some time for questions. Uh, Marion's just asked something. I might just see what that is. Um, she's asked about the optimal growing conditions in the garden, um, Digby. 
Uh, yeah, look, I, I can really only comment on West Australian conditions. Um, and certainly over here, you know, we've probably got the highest disease load of, uh, of anywhere in the world in terms of um, the rust and the ink spot. But generally, they need uh, full sun. Uh, they need a well-drained soil. Uh, and they need uh, not to be planted too closely together so you can get airflow um, past the foliage and the flowers to limit that amount of disease. Now that, you know, we have bred them for disease tolerance and certainly they are far more tolerant than other small flowered anagazanthus, but they will still get some. So, um, but they can, that can be managed from year to year by, uh, by cutting the foliage down to ground level and they'll come back up. Um, but container culture is a really good way of growing these plants as well. Um, they, they perform exceptionally well in containers. So that's another option for people whose ground conditions aren't uh, sufficient enough um, to grow them. Mm. Now there's a lot more questions coming through. So I'll just go through some of them. Um, lifespan, Helen Young's asking about the lifespan that you would be expecting. Yeah, again, uh, you know, because these are just first out, that, that's not the easiest question to answer. But, but certainly, if you put them in the ground here in Western Australia, uh, you should get uh, four to five years out of them at least. Now, some, are, some will be um, less than that, but certainly Masquerade, the blue one, appears to be the toughest of the five. Um, so I would expect that one... Uh, to last at least that long. And in a container, um, it, they'll just keep going. And for those who have experience growing anagazanthus, that, you know, you can divide these um, once they get to a certain size. So just get out your old bread knife and cut them in half and uh, put them in another pot. So um, certainly in containers, they, they'll be um, longer lived than in the ground, but they still should give you a pretty good display. Okay, um, so a few, few more questions about climate. Um, Steve's asked about humidity and uh, Lynn's asked about cool climate. So um, I guess that's two, two things that we'll be dealing with on the East Coast. Yeah, so certainly cool climate. I mean, here it gets down to, you know, one degree Celsius during winter. Um, and these plants, uh, you know, if we bring them in to flower in autumn, they'll continue flowering through winter. Uh, without any trouble at all. And in fact, the blue colour appears to be a little brighter in winter, spring than say in summer. Right. And that's probably because it's an anthocyanin. Um, so I haven't noticed an issue for, for cool, humid. Warm, humid, uh, I don't really have that experience. So probably thinking about Sydney, Brisbane, um, you know, I can't really comment. Angus may... Uh, he used to live up that way, so he may have an understanding a bit more than I do about uh, the possibilities of growing them in those areas. Uh, Angus will speak in a sec, but he's actually asked another question yeah. about fungal diseases affecting the rhizome, which he said is a problem yeah. in the rhizome. But Angus, look, that is true. So, so Pythium um, and Phytophthora are two diseases that will affect the rhizome, uh, at, but these particular varieties. To date, I haven't noticed an issue with that. Certainly some of the um, experimental hybrids that we get through um, do uh, pass away after being infected, but uh, particularly masquerade appears to be pretty tough in that respect. Angus, did you want to say something? Sure. Yeah, I, I find um, where you've got poor drainage and humid conditions, the, those uh, grey leaf types uh, do seem to be much more prone to those uh, rhizome uh, rotting fungi uh, that, that yeah. Digby just mentioned. And whereas uh, straight flavidus, the tall kangaroo paw, uh, seems to actually thrive on the conditions that uh, the other ones turn up their toes at. Uh, so that's Sadly, right along the east coast, I'm now down in Tasmania uh, on the east coast, and uh, I'm finding a similar sort of result here. And uh, yeah, so poor drainage does 
seem to predispose the rhizome to those, uh, you know, uh, I think it's probably, you'd call it a collar rot or crown rot type of disease. Uh, and the humid conditions tend to favour those um, <clears throat> leaf spotting diseases, the rust and also um, the ink spot, which is um, in the past has been diagnosed as being uh, caused by a type of alternaria fungus. So uh, I think it's, um, as Digby mentioned, uh, growing in containers and if uh, you can sort of uh, keep them in a rain shelter or a greenhouse. Uh, the grey leaf types like the, uh, the new series um, are extremely uh, successful and uh, I've been able to keep them going for uh, many years by dividing every uh, few years when they lose a bit of vigour and uh, yeah, just, just uh, keeping them with uh, a well-drained container situation, they will uh, be quite uh, happy along most of the East Coast. So uh, it does seem to be the, the uh, wet feet sort of thing that uh, is the thing that really kills them in my experience on the East Coast. Thanks, Angus. Now, um, Digby, there's just another question from Trevor, which was sort of two questions, but brought into one climate change and climate getting hotter he said how do they deal with extended 45 degree weather which you would have had recently in Perth I think uh, yeah look just before I answer that Angus's point about flavitus uh, is a very good one and that's one of the reasons that we're bringing flavitus into the breeding of these plants so that you know they've got a much wider tolerance uh, but yeah look we've had the most brutal summer on record over here. Um, to date, we've had something like 11 or 12 uh, days over 40 degrees. The previous record was seven. Uh, and these uh, plants in containers here at Kings Park have, have come through with flying colours. You do get a bit of um, uh, flower distortion once it hits, you know, 41, 42. But in terms of foliage, it's not a problem uh, and they will keep flowering. So we've had um, both Masquerade and Carnival are the two that we have had flowering right here, here right through summer. So, um, yeah, that the heat uh, doesn't appear to bother them as long as they have enough water um, to, you know, to keep them going. So you know, if they dry out, they'll probably not do as well, but certainly in a container being watered, the heat's not a problem. Mm, thanks for that. Now, Helen wants to know when is the best time to cut the foliage to the ground? I think that's probably a good question because we often hear that's the thing to do. And when is the best time to do that? So we normally do it here at Kings Park uh, about now. Um, so that um, not, be, not at the start of summer because you don't want the new leaves uh, emerging when it's getting really hot. So now I'd say um, through to March, maybe early April, and that'll allow the plant to grow and then have their normal spring flowering. Um, if you cut them back too late, you'll probably affect that flowering. So mm. that's the time of year that we do it here. Did we talk about frost when we were doing that climate talk? I don't think I mentioned frost. So um, again, in the containers here, um, they didn't appear to be affected by frost. So, uh, you know, different situations, but I don't, you know, we don't get frosts to minus five or anything like that. So I don't know how tolerant they are, uh, but they certainly have some tolerant to the cold, tolerance to the cold. Good. Now, Steve wants to know about, um, oh, Angus says, I find feeding is also very important in keeping the plants vigorous. So comments on feeding and what you would recommend? Uh, just a well-balanced fertiliser. We use slow-release fertiliser and my recommendation would be, you know, a six-month slow-release fertiliser every six months or when they're, when they're looking, um, you know, maybe a bit nutrient deficient. You can use liquid fertilisers on them and that'll give them a boost, certainly, uh, in autumn. Just keep your phosphorus uh, levels uh, 
flow when you're doing that and probably don't use a full strength liquid fertilizer if that's what you're doing but they okay. generally respond well and these ones in particular don't have flavitus in them but those hybrids with flavitus uh, respond even better they love uh, fertilizer great now angus says he's got a comment on frost i didn't think you'd get a lot of frost down there angus <laughs> No, I, I, uh, where I am on the Tasman Peninsula, I probably get down to about minus one, but I have uh, been uh, supplying some plants to a, a garden club enthusiast who is in a much colder uh, inland area, probably down to about minus four or minus five. And I've been quite pleasantly surprised by the... Um, results that he's getting with a range of uh, kangaroo paw hybrids. So in my experience, yeah, those colder frosts will tend to cause burning of the foliage, particularly on the tips. Uh, but um, generally the rhizome survives quite well. So the taller varieties, um, if they get that frost damage on the upper foliage, uh, you can trim them back before they uh, start to butt up with their flowers, trim back that uh, damaged foliage or just leave it and uh, then the tall stems outgrow the, um, the damage and uh, you still get quite a spectacular display. But there's definitely, um, you know, they're more a coastal distribution in the wild. So... They don't tend to occur in the inland areas of Western Australia where you would uh, get more frost. Um, but another comment I wanted to make too is uh, that I've been growing my uh, kangaroo paw collection, a lot of them now in uh, wicking beds uh, oh. with, with great results. So they're um, more or less continuous supply of moisture by capillary watering and and with the uh, control release fertilizers that Digby mentioned uh, it is also giving me very clean foliage so a lot of the blackening of the foliage I find is uh, can be caused by those leaf spotting diseases but it can also be caused by nutrient stress or lack of nutrients or water so by growing in uh, in the wicking beds, I've been able to grow some very clean uh, plants. And um, yeah, it, it's quite uh, surprising how, how uh, quickly they grow and uh, the, the floral displays they produce. And just while I've got the floor too, Digby, I would love to thank you also for all the cooperation that we've had over the years and the uh, free sharing of, of knowledge and uh, information. And uh, it's always been a fabulous uh, open book whenever I come to Kings Park. So uh, yeah, just uh, wanted to uh, thank you in return for all of that uh, experience over the years. Mm, yes, thank you very much, Bibi. Now there's Thanks. a... There's a few other comments uh, coming along. Um, Steve's asked about deadheading. Uh, yeah, look, it, it's something um, we practice here, uh, particularly for the container ones. And so just removing uh, those older flower heads uh, works really well. It, it keeps um, the display looking vibrant if, if you do that, uh, unless you're looking to, of course, harvest seed from them, which... Uh, uh, you then don't don't do that, um, but yeah, absolutely, it's a, a good strategy. Okay, and Trevor's commented on mulch. We mulch quite deeply, five to six centimetre coarse rough stuff. How does this affect the new plants? And he also wants to know about the watering regime for potted plants. How often should you be watering potted plants? Yeah, so just with mulch. Um, you need to be careful about the type of mulch that you use. If you're using an organic mulch uh, that holds onto moisture, that can drive disease, uh, leaf diseases, uh, particularly ink spots. So you, you need to be a little careful doing that. Using a mulch, uh, an inorganic um, uh, coarse mulch uh, is, is very beneficial because um, it stops the, the surface of the soil drying out and 
allows that uh, more constant moisture to be maintained. Uh, and Angus mentioned the, the wicking beds, that's sort of a similar principle uh, to that in a lot of ways. Um, what was, sorry, what was, the, oh, how often should you water yeah. um, a container? Look, uh, every uh, couple of times a week uh, in an area like Perth uh, should be sufficient if your container is deep enough. Um, you shouldn't need to do any more than that, except in, you know, when it's starting to hit 37, 38 degrees, you'll probably need to water a bit more than that. Um, the, the principles really, you don't want the plant to get into water stress, because uh, as Angus mentioned that, um, you know, it, it can lead to uh, leaf diseases and, and the plant just doesn't look as good. So, um, you can use water monitoring devices that you can just get at your local hardware store to, to see how dry your soil is. Mm. But over here, a couple of times a week seems to work quite well. Okay. Um, uh, Angus has also added that uh, when plants are budding up to flower, uh, they've got a very high water demand from his experience. Yeah, that, that is true, yes. Yeah. Now, um, there's probably some other questions will pop through about... Um, <clears throat> growing, but I know Judy Horton wants to know about getting hold of images and information, and she's obviously keen to get this out to the next publication. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, you can contact us directly. We're, we are in the process of setting up a publicly available web page where people can access both information and the images. I'm not sure that that's live yet, uh, but anyone who wants images or wants to uh, want some information, can either contact me or the media people here at Kings Park and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll assist you with getting that, that information out and those images to you. So. Okay, that sounds good. I, I can send everyone through the, um, the uh, emails for, for Digby and for the media in yeah. Kings Park. <clears throat> Angus says he also has um, images um, on his, he's available on Angus at gardeningwithangus.com.au. So that's kind of you, Angus, thank you. Um, and I was going to say, you know, I've got to say a huge thanks to everyone at Kings Park too for making this webinar happen um, because it, it really came about because of Sue McDougall saying we're about to, <clears throat> to launch them and we'd like the uh, media to have a bit of a preview before they do the official launch. So I'm really grateful. This is exactly the sort of thing that um, the Horticultural Media Association would really like to do for its members to keep us all up to date, you know, ahead of them uh, hitting the shops and things before we start getting um, asked questions about them to, to keep us one step ahead of the, <clears throat> of the pack, so to speak. So thank you very much for that. Now, has anyone got any um, no, yeah. questions? Yeah. Sue, I just mentioned, you know, Sue McDougall is, is the new um, Director of the West Australian Botanic Gardens here. Uh, uh, those who would know her, because she's been in the media for some time. Um, and so this is, you know, she's really driven this type of activity for us. Uh, and it's been great. And so you'll see more of it from Kings Park. Um, but, and it's fairly new now. So we're just sort of learning as we go. Mm, well, certainly, I think it's been fantastic. I, I know everyone that's listening um, would agree. This is just such exciting information to get. And the, the, um, the flowers are just so astonishingly beautiful um, that I hope that they really, you know, go ahead and leaps and bounds. Um, any more um, questions yeah. from people? Oh, can, can I just say they've been breeding roses for 400 years and they've been <laughs> breeding anagosanthus for, what, about 20 or 30? Yeah. So, and it's been quite extraordinary from my perspective just to see the range of colours that's emerged from this uh, genus because most of those colours you don't see in nature. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think we're all wondering how good it's going to be in the future. Yeah. You, you mentioned that the research with the Edith Cowan University. How long is that one? Was it $0.5 million? How long will that take to, to expend and we'll get... Uh, that's, a, that's a three-year program. Right. Uh, but it's likely to drive more research uh, following that. So initially it's, it's the three years... And yeah, that's a, a to great outcome. More about the colours and things, because that's just yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Karen said, Smith has said, excellent information, thank you. Um, so yes, I, I think everyone would agree with that. Um, and Matt Carroll, oh, Matt's back. 
Poor Matt. Will I share Matt's disaster of locking himself out of his office? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, says Matt. So obviously, I don't know if he's got back into his office or not. I've, I've, I've made my way in. So oh, uh, thankfully, well. someone came and let me back in. But at least we could get it underway via phone to begin with. So, but thank yeah. you very much, Stevie. And Jennifer. Technology is wonderful. Um, Angus is saying kangaroo pearl breeding cooperation between the public sector, Kings Park, with RAM and myself shows what we can do to bring the best of our wonderful flora to the world market. I mean, yes, that's astonishing, isn't it? That this is a global release that we're talking about. Yeah, okay. uh, it absolutely is, um, and that that's part of you know the the relationship with Ram and Angus is is the model that we use now. So with Gravilia, we we have a relationship with Banara Nursery here and and Ball in the US, uh, and so it works really well uh, for us. Um, and Anaxanthus is an a, is an emerging global plant now, and you know like waxflower camelosium has done. Uh, you know, that is a global plant. Anagazanthus mm. is, is pretty much uh, coming along and will, you know, achieve the same, if not more, given the, the um, different uses you can put to it and the colour range. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those people who live in Sydney might like to try and organise some sort of a day out to ram botanicals. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, I know they have trial beds there. And um, so, yeah, speak with uh, Ryan Weber. He's the contact there at, at RAMS uh, if you want to arrange something like that. Okay. So someone make note of that. <laughs> Matt? <laughs> Judy? Judy will be a good one to do that. Um, yeah. Matt, did you want to say anything else? No, I was just going to say, yeah, that'd be great to go and visit up to uh, Humby Umby, isn't it, where they've got their uh, site through there and have a look look through so um but uh no, no nothing apart from that except for again saying thank you Digby, for uh, uh volunteering your time so freely and knowledge and uh it's been great to see so many people jumping on yeah and thank you angus as well for, for and angus yeah definitely it was great to hear your voice first angus through there i thought there's a voice on this and then i'm popping across so uh very very good to see you yeah down there, oh, always a pleasure and uh if anyone's uh in tasmania feel free to uh Come and uh, visit. I'm t getting uh, hitting my straps with the kangaroo paw breeding down here now. So uh, yes, uh, anyone uh, who's in the vicinity, feel free to uh, drop me a line and and come and have a look. Have you got your bed and breakfast up and running yet, Angus? <laughs> well, more, yes, for HMA members. Uh, <laughs> no That's problem. Pleasant. Membership service we didn't think we'd be offering, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thank you. And, and Gabby, of course, is in Tassie as well. So we're, we're gradually getting more members down here. Um, so I guess if there's nothing else that people want to ask or add or comment on, um, don't forget this has been recorded and we will get it up onto the website as soon as we can. Um, where all our previous webinars are. If you've missed any of them, they're all there to be looked at and uh, enjoyed. And I think this one's so timely that uh, we'll definitely need to get this out um, through, our, through our resources um, as soon as we can. So everyone, thank you very, very much. Um, Digby, on behalf of all of us listening and everyone who listened in the future, it was a wonderful presentation. No, yeah. yeah, it was great. Well, thanks thank for the opportunity. You. We appreciate thank it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Digby. Thanks. Lovely. Uh, see you, Angus. Thanks. Oh, see me sometime. Bye bye, bye, -bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Hey, oh, bye.